talking with the experts. In episode 382, Ash Shastri discusses how we can close more clients through authentic communications rather than using tactics. So one of the most important things we talk about is your own type of communication. So again, there's, you know, four different levels of the way you communicate. And this is about your own language use and how you respond to other people. So in this example, we're kind of moving away a little bit from public speaking or presenting, but more like, let's say, team communications. You can use that in social settings too. So you can either be a passive communicator so you basically accept what other people are saying and this has nothing to do with your personality style um i remember a little while ago i was talking about this with someone and they said oh but you know i'm actually quite a confident person i'm very outgoing i can't be passive well actually that's completely you know mutually exclusive because you can be a very confident person but if you're in an uncertain and you know situation that you're just unfamiliar with you can default to a passive communication style so Talking with the experts. Talking with the experts would love to acknowledge Global Glamping Charities Incorporated for generously supporting this podcast. Global Glamping Charities, solving homelessness in all of its forms. Reach out to them at globalglamping.org. Welcome to Talking with the Experts. This is where we discuss great ideas to take your business to the next level. How do we know these ideas work? Well, it's because we're talking with business owners who are using these ideas. Business owners who have years of experience and expertise. All things business by business owners for business owners. And now, here is your host, Rose Davidson. Hello and welcome to Talking with the Experts. I'm your host, Rose Davidson from rosedavidson.com. Talking with the Experts is about all things business by business owners for business owners. You can find it on all good podcasting, streaming platforms and on YouTube. Now, do you feel that you are a good communicator? My next guest, Ash Shastri, is going to be discussing with us some communication skills that we could do better. Uh, Ash um, has a training company that helps ambitious, high performers become excellent communicators and new world leaders. Throughout his five plus years of working with executive teams, Ash um, has gained a unique insight into the qualities of becoming a leader. He used this to create formulaic systems that you can apply in your business and in your life. Welcome, Ash, and thank you so much for being here today. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. So how did you get uh, to where you are now in your business with, uh, you know, working with, you know, Fortune 100 companies? Well, to be honest, I was a management consultant uh, for five years or so and working in a, a global company. So I had a lot of exposure towards that sort of realm. And my job at that time was to train leaderships and the teams and making sure that they were able to communicate better, they were able to improve their processes and grow their business. So I had uh, a goal when I first started of saying I want to become the fastest like partner and the fastest time ever in that company. So I talked to a person who had done that and that was 12 years. So I was like, okay, cool. How can I do it in 11? It sounds pretty weird, but that's kind of how my brain thought at the time. So going through that process, COVID hit, and then I realized that, you know, a lot of exposure of other people doing things. And I thought, oh, this person has done this in 12 years, but other business owners are achieving what this person's achieved in four or five. So my target now changed, right, to figure out what I needed to do. So a lot of trial and errors later, I found out that one of the things that I was actually very good at that I did for my work, and that's the thing that made me a high performer was communication. So I was able to communicate and articulate my thoughts much better than most people in in my level. And I had the confidence to do it. I was able to speak better for the for the best part of uh, whatever I was doing in management consulting. So I figured that's the area I should go down and, and form a company on so I can help other people to do the same. Of course, like others, I started with talking to my friends and family and helping those guys out and people in my immediate circle. 
And um, yeah, eventually I started speaking in local events. And that's where I met somebody who was an ex, ex, ex client when I was in a job who was working at a company that I had trained at before. So he said, Hey, you know, if you started your own company doing this specific thing, rather than an overall business process improvement, why don't you come and speak uh, at my company and help me out? So that's what got me into helping teams out rather than just individuals. So while I help individuals to become high performers and, you know, become excellent communicators, I now also focus on helping teams and companies to communicate their leadership better and retain staff because in the last couple of years, that's been a big problem for people. Yeah, the the great resignation has hit after COVID. So, yeah, it's, I mean, I don't blame people for not wanting to go back and sit in an office where, you know, it's all full of germs. Why not just sit at home? And it's just as easy to work from home than it is to go to an office. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And we found that a lot of times it's people's own fear, like the leadership team's fear that is driving them to not adapt to the new way of working. So by working with them, I can kind of, you know, take those fears away and actually say, well, how do you actually manage the people who are working in a hybrid setting? And how do you have the confidence to still be an effective leader in that new new system? Mm-hmm. Yeah, hybrid's the way to go, I think. Anyway, how what, what makes a good communicator, Ash? So for me, it's all about kind of knowing what you're talking about, right? So this doesn't mean to say you should never talk about things you don't know, but there's a difference between the level of detail you go to when you know what you're talking about versus when you don't. So a common example I give is people who present because that, that's my world, right? People are presenting different topics and say they found a huge list of data set that they needed to analyze. Now, what happens normally is people take that data set, they analyze it, they have the analysis in the PowerPoint, but they also put this massive table and they just you know, put it behind you. Cool. Let me talk you through this table. And then everybody's falling asleep while you're going through the whole thing. So if you truly know what you're talking about, and then you work on your own confidence level to be okay with not delving into the deep, deep roots of everything, you're able to communicate in a better way. So you can just tell people what they need to know. So for me, that's the best thing that I can probably tell people is before you go and talk, just think about what is it that the other person needs to know, right? Once you've figured that out, you can just go into relevant tech relevant depth like if somebody was seven years old you're not going to go and use all this massive words jargon and try to explain things equally if you're speaking to a phd you know you're not going to go and dumb everything down so just understanding the audience will allow you to communicate in a better way this first thing yeah absolutely i I totally agree with that and uh, um you know how you speak to a child is certainly not how you speak to a professor (laughs) But Absolutely. I guess um, what about, you know, the people that have different ways of uh, of listening? You know, you've got the one that needs all the detail and then you've got someone who just likes, you know, the bare bones of something and then, you know, if they'll ask questions to get further detail. How do you communicate and differentiate your communication style to fit those people? Yeah, this is a really, really good question. So and with some of the training that I do, we obviously got the four quadrants of the way people think and the way people understand. I think this is pretty much widely known. It's uh, there's a disc philosophy, there's, you know, multiple different color system, whatever that is, but there's basically four quadrants that people normally fall into. So it's usually the driver, the analytical thinker, uh, the expressive person and the amiable person. So the driver is typically a person who's making fast decisions. They don't really have time for anything and they want to, they want to be able to get answers really quickly. The analytical thinker is the person you explain who needs all the details. And the amiable person is happy to just have a chat, can't come to a decision as quickly as you might want them to. And the expressive person is just quite loud and it might get quite difficult to to get a decision out of them. So these are the four types of people that you have to remember. In the training, we talk about how you can identify each of those types of people quite quickly, but a really simple way to do it is you have to understand where majority of the people that you speak to sit. So depending on the type of job you're doing, type of audience you have, type of clientele that you're working with, if you're a business owner, you will know, right? If you're in a tech side of things, you can assume that a lot of people will be analytical thinkers. So if you don't know your audience properly, I would go based on the assumption that you think it is and prepare for that, right? So this is if you're doing it for the first time after listening to this talk. (laughs) So you would do that as the first instance, but you would have the information needed for the other three types 
in your appendix if you're presenting or in your back of your mind if you're just talking to people. So you go with the assumption of the type of person that, that you're speaking to, give that information, and based on the feedback you get and the questions you get and the response, you can adapt for the next time. Um, the way I typically do it, and you know, statistically speaking, more people are analytical thinkers than any of the other three. Just, just when they're, uh, especially when they're talking about something or when they're responding to something that they're unfamiliar with, because people are, tend to be risk averse, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to err on the side of giving a little bit more detail um, than you think that someone just needs to make a decision, especially if you're in a sales situation, right? We talk about that as well. So if you're in sales or communication side of things, you don't want to just give like the tiniest bit of info and then say, is that cash or credit card, <laughs> right? So you want to give a little bit more and then see how the feedback works. And so you can iterate your, your going um, from then on. Yeah, make, that makes perfect sense. Um, I think, and you, yes, you're right. You've, you've got to tailor your, your conversation or your communication to suit the audience. Um, mm. And sometimes it's, sometimes it's a bit hard. It, it's always, I find, a good idea to ask the organiser. Um, you know what types of people are sitting in the audience because they because they normally work with those people quite closely yeah. they would probably have a better idea than what anyone else would have so it's always a yeah. good idea I, I know I do a, um, a webinar on PowerPoint presentations and communication it was obviously one of the one of the parts of that because you need to be able to communicate efficiently to so you're not reading from the slides all the time so, yeah, I really get what you're saying. And, and part of what you just said is actually in my training. So it, it, was, it was quite interesting. Um, yeah, so what are the skills other than, you know, knowing your audience um, and using those skills to the four, you know, the four levels of communicators, what other skills might people need? So one of the most important things we talk about is your own type of communication. So again, there's you know four different levels of the way you communicate, and this is about your own language use and how you respond to other people. So in this example, we're kind of moving away a little bit from public speaking or presenting, but more like, let's say, team communications. You can use that in social settings too. So you can either be a passive communicator, so you basically accept what other people are saying, and this has nothing to do with your personality style. Um, I remember a little while ago, I was talking about this with someone and they said, oh, but, you know, I'm actually quite a confident person. I'm very outgoing. I can't be passive. Well, actually, that's completely, you know, mutually exclusive because you can be a very confident person. But if you're in an uncertain and, you know, situation that you're just unfamiliar with, you can default to a passive communication style. So that's the first level. And I, I can explain what each of those things, you know, how you can identify those are. But if you're a passive communicator, you typically are somebody who's malleable, right? You can say yes to most things that come your way. Our passive aggressive communicator is the next level. And I think, you know, if you leave notes around, or if you know somebody who leaves notes around, you're probably a passive aggressive communicator. Um, the next level is assertive. And this is the thing that I typically tend to push people towards to become an assertive communicator, because that's somebody who knows their boundaries and knows their values and is not afraid to stick to it. There's a fine line, however, between become, being assertive and then being aggressive as a communicator. And that's the fourth level. Aggressive communicator is like, if you're a person who points a lot or if you know somebody who points a lot, yeah, that they could be like teachers. If you think about it, there are some teachers who will be aggressive communicators just because they think that's the way to control the crowd. So they'd be like, you stop talking, like pay attention. So if you hear those kinds of people, aggressive communicators. So for me, in my experience, what I found is the assertive communication style has been the most effective in almost all scenarios. Not in every single scenario, but almost all scenarios. And the reason for that is you're able to communicate what you want to, uh, what you want to say, your viewpoints, without offending another person. Uh, typically, you you use this in times when you're in a conversation and maybe you're being challenged or you want to challenge somebody else's viewpoint so you wouldn't you know if you're an aggressive communicator you're like hey i think you're wrong but you can't say that to me how could you say that right like those things will evoke an emotional response from the other person that can quickly lead into an argument falling out whatever other problems 
And the same example, if you think about a passive aggressive person, they probably wouldn't say anything in person there. They just accept it, move on and then write them a message. <laughs> I'll never want to be speaking to you again. You know, we're no longer friends. Um, if you're a passive person, you might just take it and just be sad. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, mull over an argument over your head in, in the shower the next day, like, oh, I should have said this, you know, if I had another chance, I would say this, I would say this, I would say this. But in reality, when, when time comes, you're not going to say anything. So if you push yourself to becoming an, a, a, an assertive communicator, then at that time, you're able to call that person out like, hey, what did you mean by that? You know, that's like, if I can give you one thing, like your listeners, one thing that they can take on board and use in their day-to-day lives is anytime they're challenged, anytime they feel like they have just been offended or anytime they have a negative interaction, instead of flipping straight to you know, a response that's a statement or an offend, you know, hey, don't talk to me like that, right? Even though you think you're standing up for yourself, I would always advocate benefit of the doubt question at least one time. Because then you will, it does two things. One, you will already ask this person, like what's going on so you can get more context because maybe you're the one who's misinterpreting. But secondly, the most important thing is it's like a soft warning check, right? Like you're, you are indicating to that person that you did not like that bit of interaction. And by asking them to explain themselves, you might actually get them to just back down. So just by saying, hey, what did you mean by that? It's probably the best way to start assertively. And even if you're a passive person, you can do this because you're not directly question- like you know saying something bad to someone, you're just questioning, hey, what did you mean by this? <laughs> and that yeah. person will likely back down. Yeah, sometimes it, um, it it's easy to be triggered by something that someone said, um, and they may not have meant a, a, an offence by what they've said, but, you know, we've received it as an offence. Um, I'll, I'll give an example. There was something written um, in a message the other day, and I took it quite badly. I, On reflection, however, I don't think they meant it the way I took it. It was my own feelings that triggered a response Um, I ended up deleting the response however I don't know if anyone read it and so um, you know my bad it was a knee-jerk reaction to to something that um, was just a miscommunication yeah then that I think that happens quite a lot one of the so we did a training um maybe like six months ago, seven months ago, it was like passive to assertive training. It was like a small mass class type thing. And the one, one of the things that was like a crowd favorite, the tip was anytime anything happens, like take a two second breather. It's like before responding, just like the moment you do that, I think there's like Mel Robbins or someone who did some study and found that your brain focusing on something other than the immediate interaction that's happening will will give you other ideas of how to respond so if you do that that little two second pause it doesn't feel awkward even if you're in a face-to-face conversation but it definitely works much better if you're in a text or written conversation in some way but yeah it just allows your brain to not have that knee-jerk reaction that then affects the other person so you can just step back and say uh how can i ask a question here (laughs) You and know, I've I mulled I over it. I mulled over it before I wrote the response, and I still wrote the response because <laughs> it, it affected me that much. Um, yeah, but but there's no but. It's just inexcusable. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the one of the things that I learned quite early on is like that somebody said. I don't know how true this is, but I've believed it, and it worked quite well for me. It's just whoever asks the questions controls the conversations. So if you ever feel, usually people, you know, like in the example you gave me, it's probably a power dynamic thing right like someone's trying to get one over you and you're like hey you, know, you can't treat me like that like i'm not going to stand down for that that's so, how i felt that's how i felt yeah. yeah so if you think about you know whoever asks the questions controls the conversation because i don't know what it is but you know if you think about a teacher student reaction right a teacher asks a question you now have to explain so i think it stems from that so whenever this something like this happens you could just step back ask a question now suddenly the power dynamic has shifted, mm. right? You're in a position of power and the other person has to explain themselves. And that has that has worked for me quite well in the past. So that's been like a card favorite as well in the training we did. Yeah, in hindsight, that's what I should have done, but I didn't. So yeah, that's, you know, it's, 
we all have these little foibles that we do and uh, get ourselves into, you know, things, do things that we know yeah. at the time even aren't really the right thing, but we go ahead and do it anyway because we feel so offended. Yeah, 100%. I mean, yeah, like emotions cannot always be checked, right? <laughs> no. you, you, you can know all this stuff, but sometimes it just yeah. does it. Yeah, the emotion takes over. The lizard brain took over and that was it. Bang, it was done. <laughs> no looking Ash, back now <laughs> yeah absolutely so would you i mean you went through and explained the four ways or the four um you know passive passive aggressive um assertive aggressive you were, it's all that communication style that was really great thank you for sharing um what about as a listener if you're one of those things you know so the person yeah. who might be a passive aggressive communicator is maybe speaking to a passive person or an aggressive person how do we you know try and come to even ground i guess yeah this is a, a really good point so i think everybody has the ability to swap between all of those ways um the first way is to just you figure out what you are and when i mean what you are is it's everybody has a default that they get to in times of crisis. So however you handle crisis scenarios will determine what type of thinker or communicator you are. So I guess the question is if you're a passive person and somebody aggressive is talking to you, which happens quite a lot, how do you then stand up for yourself? Or I guess, how do you come to some sort of alignment? Uh, the best way that I found is, I was working with a client, actually, this is probably better to give an example. I was working with a client who was facing the scenario where she was a really, really good worker at work, but she was very passive. She thoroughly believed that my work has to do the talking for me. I don't have to do anything else. But her boss was not so, uh, not so good at recognizing her work and was a bit of a slave driver. So her boss, she came over to her and you know, would be very aggressive um, to my client. So that's how we, when we started working together, Hey, you know, like I feel really bad. I, I can't speak in meetings. Like I, I don't have any confidence to actually talk about these things. What do I do? So basically there are three things that you can do for this scenario. First and foremost, you have to have to have to work on your confidence. Like there's no way ever that you will even ask a question that we talked about earlier. If you're a super passive person and you have already been beaten down by the aggressive person, like you will just by default, take it and be upset. So the first thing you have to do is gain confidence in, and the way to do that is in two different ways. So one is the way I believe in confidence is just your own ability to believe in yourself. That's it. So confidence is like, you know, you can do something. So an ease and an internal confidence is quite hard to, and long term to get, get up, but external confidence is quite easy to muster up. So you just, you can almost like circumvent the system by looking at your successes and being like, oh, wow. I'm actually pretty good. And so that's like a short-term hack. Then the second one, another short-term hack is, I believe that confidence comes as soon as you achieve a, achieve a goal that you set for yourself, right? It can be a really tiny goal. Like let's say you wanna um, run 50 meters and really fast, right? Fastest you've ever done. The moment you achieve that, you will be over the moon, right? You're like, yeah, I can do anything. And if somebody tells you to go in an argument, you're like, yeah, I'm going in an argument now. So you like the, your ability to solve problems and defeat your inner demons becomes so much more amplified when you have just achieved something. Mm -hmm. So what we did with her is exactly that. You combine those two things, look at your past successes and her work was very, very good. So we can be like, look at all the things you've done, right? Like have your peers done that? No. Okay, cool. So you are clearly the best in your, in your region, like in your team. Great, now you've done that. What small goal can we set that you can smash through right now? And so for her, um, and it has to be something that you know you can do and it's not related to the thing that you're trying to tackle, right? So for her, it was a physical one. And I typically like physical ones because they're easy to, to break through. She was like, I, I wanna do five pushups. I'm like, great, okay, do some five, five pushups right now. And she was like, oh, you know, three, I'm struggling. Okay, great, so why don't you work on it for like two, three days, five pushups, you can probably smash it. Great. Two, three days, she messaged me at like, when it was like 10 p.m., she messaged me like, oh my God, I just did my first five push-ups. I feel amazing. I'm like, great. You know, this is awesome. Because now you, in the morning, you can do the same thing. 
So you're a passive person. In the morning, if you achieve something, testosterone goes up. Now you're suddenly not so passive, right? So now you can combine it with the questioning method to say, hey, can you explain to me what you mean by that? And so next day morning, I'm like, hey, smash your five push-ups before you go into your meeting. Even if you get sweaty, it's fine. No one's going to care. So just go for it. So she did the same thing. She did the five push-ups. She then went into the meeting and she was sitting. You know, she was kind of like, oh my God, here's, here it is. It's going to come. It's going to come. So her boss asks, her, like, you know, is aggressively communicating with her, saying whatever he says. Uh, or she, she says, sorry. And then she was basically just had the question, oh, hey, sorry. Like, you know, um, I don't mean to be ungrateful or anything, but I just want to find out a little bit more. What do you mean by this? And yeah, that one question genuinely just got them on the same page because the boss's anger just immediately calmed down. And so they were able to match their level of speed, right? Normally aggressive communicators are a, a lot louder than passive communicators. So by having to explain it, this boss couldn't, you know, they couldn't just be in their fast pace. So I think that's the first way to probably do it. I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, say that it's gonna work 100% of the time that this person's gonna always come down. You might have to do it a few times before the person comes down. Because the alternative is also being like, are you stupid? Like, how would you not know about this? Right, and some people can can say that. I would say if you're in that sort of toxic environment, you should probably get out. Absolutely, <laughs> like no one... yeah, I wouldn't stick around, no. <laughs> yeah, no one should speak to you in a derogatory or degrading manner especially at the workplace. So if that's happening to you, you know, there's different ways that you should probably deal with it. Raise a complaint to HR, leave, you know, switch teams, whatever it is you need to do, um, or you become aggressive yourself, but that never really works out well. So for me, asking that question works. So you raise your level of confidence, ask the question. The great thing is once you have asked that question, your sense of belief that you can do something you know, of course, it's going to go up, right? You're like, wow, I've never, ever spoken back to my boss before. I've just done that. Like, I am unstoppable. So you can ask the next question. <laughs> yeah, and building confidence, self-confidence is very important, um, especially if you're a passive person. And it's not as hard as they have themselves believe that it is. It's, um, as you say, set yourself a small goal and then achieve that and then set the next one. And, you know, the more goals you achieve, the, the the stronger you become physically and mentally, I think. Yeah, 100%. And I think, you know, your level of self-confidence in you will just keep growing. And it's like a, it's an up and down thing. I used to think that once you start gaining confidence, you just like, you know, you never lose it. But I definitely found that it's, it's like an up and down thing, right? Based on what's happening in your life at that time, based on how you feel, like your emotions have a massive role to play in how confident you are. But if you think that your confidence is just your ability to believe in your abilities, like it's weird, but yeah, it's just your way of believing in yourself. It, it probably works out quite well because usually people aren't going to be in a situation where they say, you know what, I don't think I can do that. And if they do, you just have to give them physical evidence to show that they can, and then they can overcome that barrier. Absolutely. Great, great advice. I like that. Terrific. Ash, where can people find you if they'd like to learn more about what you offer or, you know, just have a chat? Uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, you can find me. It's Boss with Ash. And so you can message me. I'm happy to have a chat with anyone. Uh, Instagram is probably the best way because I'm usually on there active anyway. But, yeah, you can basically reach me on all of those platforms. YouTube. <laughs> yeah, absolutely wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Um, Ash, do you have any words of wisdom that you would like to share with the uh, listeners today? Yeah. So for me, it, I, I had to think a lot about you know what I would want people to, to take away. So I want to give two things. Um, one is if you are a person who wants to become a high performer, you want to you know be recognized as someone who's extremely good at what they do, don't just stick to my work will do the talking for me figure out how you can articulate your value. And I think that's probably the biggest thing that most people lack. And that's why, if, you know, if, you want to, if you're an employee who wants to climb the ladder, that's probably what's blocking you, right? Uh, we've all seen it where other people who are less qualified than us are getting the positions that we think we deserve. And the only thing that's stopping us is just our ability to communicate our value to the responsible person to make that decision. 
And if you're a leader, it's the same thing, right? You have to be able to articulate your value to your team so they don't leave and go to another leader who's better than them. So it's that, it's that ability to articulate their value is the thing I would work on the most. Um, and the second thing, this has helped me probably the most, is only take advice from people who have what you want to have in the specific areas that you're looking for advice in. So like, if you were looking for dating advice, you wouldn't take it from a single person, right? So it's something like that. But in all areas of our lives, we do this just unknowingly because most of the time we talk to our friends and family. So instead we should look at sources like you know, your podcast and other people where if you want to learn a specific thing, you should learn it from the people who have already got what you want to have. Right, I like that. I, I'll take that on board, that one. <laughs> yeah this is like I, somebody told me this uh maybe like a little over 10 or 12 years ago and it has genuinely changed the course of my decision making <laughs> yeah I think someone might have told me that once upon a time and I've just let it go and just done what I do like I do normally so. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I've said it again so yeah that's coming it. back <laughs> That's it. Ash, it's an absolute pleasure to meet you. And thank you so much for joining me on uh, Talking With The Experts. I've had, a, uh, I've had fun learning from you. Thank you so much. Rose, thank you so much for having me on board. And it's been great chatting with you as well. And, you know, if your listeners ever want to have a chat, then they know where to find me. Perfect. Talk soon. Yeah, have a good one. You've been listening to Talking With The Experts, hosted by Rose Davidson. Make sure you have a look at our back catalogue over at talkingwiththeexperts.com and be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on any episode. We look forward to your company next time. Talking with the Experts.